Our next speaker is Dr. John Schumann. John is an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Oklahoma School of Community Medicine, where he also directs the Internal Med Medicine Residency Program. He blogs and tweets at At Glass Hospital and writes for national publications, including TheAtlantic.com and NPR's Health Blog. And last week, he had a publication, at least online, I'm not sure if the actual issue has come out on JAMA, uh, about some work he's done about uh, patients leaving against medical advice. The title of his talk today is The Non-Ethics of Direct-to-Consumer Screening Companies, A Call to Action. John? Thanks. Thank you. Um, it's, it is great to be here. I want to, um, the, the slide is direct to consumer screening companies, as Lainey pointed out, there's it's a little bit of a typo there. But uh, I want to thank Mark for having me back and for making this all happen. And uh, this is number 25 of the conferences. I also want to give a special thanks to Lainey. I'm delighted that she introduced me and that was very nice. Lainey has been a sounding board and a mentor and continues to be so even as I am in absentia from Chicago. So I am greatly appreciative of her um, mentorship to me. Um, disclosures, I do two things uh, that are, I guess, need to be disclosed. One is I consult for a um, group called Twistle.com. It's an internet startup. Um, you know, everyone wants to get in on one of those. It's, a, uh, it's actually geared toward medical communication, doctor-to-doctor uh, -doctor communication and doctor-patient communication, and they develop an app. And all I do for them is really give them advice because for a long time I've been emailing patients back and forth. Um, even though I've been instructed by my various institutions not to do that. And the other thing is Glass Hospital is the name of my blog. I formed an LLC really to um, my burgeoning media empire uh, as a blog and a proto-journalist. I do some public radio locally in Tulsa. And so it was deemed necessary by my advisors to uh, form a company so that public radio could pay me a dollar for my content that I deliver. Um, so this is the call to action, and this talk is really to designed to get you to join in my call to action, or I should say our call to action. This work is really the brainchild of a colleague of mine named Dr. Eric Wallace, who's my associate program director and an internist in Tulsa, and Dr. Steven Weinberger, who many of you probably know, who's the executive VP and CEO of the American College of Physicians. And our call to action says basically that healthcare organizations, be they hospitals or medical centers, um, and physicians who promote high value care should actively encourage, should be encouraged to cease and desist in supporting or sponsoring direct to consumer screening companies that offer low value testing. And I will explain what I mean. So perhaps you've been at a shopping mall or a church or some other religious uh place and seen one of these buses pull up. This is the Health Fair screening bus, and I'm not picking specifically on Health, Health Fair as a company, but there are many others. And what they do is they pull up, and with the um, not only consent, but the actual encouragement of uh, be they the church leaders or the, the shopping mall uh, opportunists, they provide cash-based screening tests to unwary consumers. Um, and you'll see ads like this. These tests are quick, easy, and painless. They're trusted. No insurance is, of course, required other than your you know, hard-earned US dollars. And they often offer um, oh, sorry, bargain prices. So they, they basically mislead and offer uh, advertising that's fear-mongering, saying things like, we can help you say, stay stroke-free, or um, my doctor said I was a stroke waiting to happen. And uh, these come in the mail. These get put as uh, newspaper inserts. And, and there's heavy promotion and advertising, and so the research and advocacy we've done is to um, essentially look and just see how prevalent this is. These are all privately held companies, so data is very hard to come by in terms of the revenues, the advertising, or the prevalence. So the call to action. So um, one of the things Lainey taught me is that good advocacy actually is underpinned by good research uh, and that you have to actually build consensus. It doesn't do a lot of good. We've learned to just argue moral principles because we wind up disagreeing more than we agree, as we heard this morning. So I try to educate my patients individually and a patient came into my office bearing this ad and said hey doc look at this all I can get all six of these tests I don't know if you can see the slide for $179 what a bargain but I want you to order these tests because I can that way run it through my insurance now this was an asymptomatic 64 year old man and, and we know by national screening guidelines that there's actually no indication for any of these tests in someone who's asymptomatic non-smoker who actually exercises but he wanted those tests so we went back to educate him individually it took a long time I had to try to in a sense talk him out of these tests or, or work with him and explain why it was it was very hard for him to understand that 
Other ways in which the call to action can be, uh, we can perform our advocacy writing op-eds, journal article, investigative journalism, and I'll show you some examples of that. This was an op-ed that Eric Wallace and I wrote for the Tulsa World, which I'm sure many of you get. You can now read it online, actually. Most people don't read newspapers. But this was caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. We, we basically saw so much of this in Tulsa, and so many of our patients were coming to our office. The other insidious thing about it is not only do they use fear-mongering to get you to come in and have these tests that you don't actually need or aren't indicated, they then, talking about the ethics of it or the non-ethics of it, they tell you, they give you a letter with your result and say, oh, go talk to your doctor. So there's no doctor-patient relationship implied with any of these companies. They're merely technocrats in the sense of the word. You pay them, they offer you a service. And when you, well, I'll get to the criticism in a minute. This is the uh, academic article we did. This was in the Annals of Internal Medicine in March of last year on the ethics of commercial screening tests. And uh, it got a lot of um, uh, interest and we got a lot of response including um, a response from, uh, as you might have guessed, one of the C chief medical officers of one of the screening companies. Um, so this was the research part. We had a research assistant. This, these are actual, this is a Google map display of churches in Tulsa. Uh, it's a very uh, pretty uh, religious place, a lot of fervor, so there's, there's lots of churches, lots of opportunity to go to church. So the blue dots are 49, so, so sorry, the numbers, the denominator is about 400 churches we were able to find on um, public databases. And of those 400, we were able to, uh, the research assistant was able to reach out to 100 of those churches. 49, the blue dots, were churches that actually reported they'd either had a screening fair or been contacted by a screening company to set up a screening fair. The red dots were churches that had not had any knowledge or had not been contacted. But so of the, the sample size, about half, more than half, uh, actually had been involved with these uh, direct consumer screening companies. So um, is your life worth $87, as says the, the body uh, bag, body, the tag body? And uh, we use the lowest dose CD, CT scan available. Um, I uh, asked a, so my program is, is based at a university, but we partner with community hospitals. We don't actually have a university hospital in Tulsa. So one of the hospitals where my residents work um, has a cardiac CT scanner, and they offer, this, this to be fair is not from that ad, but they run ads in the local paper and on local websites uh, offering these discounted cardiac CTs for patients. So I went up to, we had a grand rounds from the young academic who did a, fa a fabulous grand rounds showing all of the research and all the data on coronary uh, CTs and calcium scores and why this is a compelling test and why it's safe and why we should do it. And I went up to him afterward and I said, you know, what about these ads you run offering these tests to, to really to patients in whom they aren't, they aren't indicated? And he sort of looked down and put his head in his hands and said, you know, I'm really embarrassed by that, but I work here in this for-profit hospital. We have to pay for the scanner. I'd really like to not do this, but this is sort of what I have to do. So it was this kind of a startling admission. Um, so our direct-to-consumer screening company consent decree, I'm stepping forward to what I want them to do. This is the end result, the goal I want. I want them to state openly, okay, and I, keep in mind, I'm not opposed to free enterprise. I certainly think patients, I'm all for patients who want to do it themselves. We have a profusion of Google and internet-related things where people can learn. You know, obviously there's a lot of crap out there, but they can learn uh, reasonable things uh, and be more advocate for their own health care. So I'm, I'm not in principle opposed to these companies, but I do want them to treat patients fairly. So I want them to state openly for whom their screening tests are indicated, which runs totally counter to their business model, which is to get every single person in the door, in the church, or in the shopping mall into their scanners or into their ultrasound machines so that they can make money. So I want them to um, tell for whom the tests are indicated based on you know, the current evidence-based guidelines. Uh, I want them to inform the customers of the potential risks of positive or negative screening tests, i.e. no screening test is, is foolproof, right? We know that. No, no test is perfect. The downside of testing, as you know, there's a whole genre of both medical skepticism and overdiagnosis. My two favorite books in that genre are Gil Welch's Overdiagnosed and then Otis Brawley's How We Do Harm. These are books that take the, this issue on, tackle it straight on, and essentially say that we are doing our patients a disservice, or the, or the medical community is by and large, by turning normal people into patients by fear mongering. Um, and so the, the problem of a, of a non-indicated screening test is you take a well person and you turn them into a patient. So let's say the asymptomatic individual goes in and has a carotid ultrasound and they find out they have mild to moderate blockage of their coronary artery. Well, what do they do with that information? Well, first of all, they get a letter that says, go talk to your doctor. So they come in to see me and they say, doc, look, I have a blockage in my carotid artery. I'm going to have a stroke. I'm going to die. And I say, well, no, this is a mild or moderate blockage. You're going to be fine. You shouldn't have had this test. You, you certainly should quit smoking. 
And by the way, that's one of the defense, defenses that these companies use is that they um, will scare people straight essentially and actually the data runs counter to that. But by having these tests, patients are less likely to actually improve their behavior. And then lastly, that medical organizations including hospitals, physicians should refrain from sponsoring these health screenings um, because it represents a clear conflict of interest. And we have a little bit of investigative journalism data on that and I'll show you that in a second. So this was a letter to, uh, from the uh, annals piece. Thank you for your op-ed. They called an op-ed. The problem related is more right, widespread. In my practice locale, the local hospital is detailed as the sponsor of these screenings that are conducted at local churches. I have never really ever seen religion used more seductively to enhance unneeded testing at the heart center of the local not-for-profit hospital. Unfortunately, your article will never be read by those in most, of its, uh, most in need of its message. So then there was an article last summer um, by Julie Appleby that ran on Kaiser Health News in partnership with the Washington Post. And so she did a rather exhaustive um, looking at hospital relationships with these direct-to-consumer screening companies. Um, and so like Innova, uh, Fairfax in Virginia was this, so you can find this on many different um, hospital websites. Here, here's the bus pulling up. They're proud to announce this new quick, affordable, and convenient way to get a cardiovascular health screening. And the issue really is that is a way for them to feed business into their health systems. And it's of questionable, certainly quite dubious ethical value, but it's of questionable business value as well, but hard times call for hard measures and drumming up business is probably more and more important in an era of health reform and tightened budgets. So um, this, these were some quotes actually from, uh, this is from the Jefferson Hospital website, as I mentioned, Dr. Weinberger, who's at the ACP in Philadelphia. Um, we've been in partnership also with the Consumer Affairs Group who publishes consumer reports, so they're also looking at this issue. The quote from the Health Fair, which is one of the screening companies present, we're proud to partner with a well-respected name in cardiovascular medicine. It presents a great opportunity to give even more people the peace of mind that comes from preventive health care. Very seductive, come on. Um, what about the question that these tests potentially do harm by turning innocent uh, asymptomatic people into uh, patients? Well, these tests don't do harm. People are not exposed to radiation. And that, that claim is really about the ultrasonic screening test, which is, which is true. Uh, in terms of ionizing radiation, however, when you turn someone into a patient or create anxiety and fear that they then live with pr principally, uh, r realistically forever and wind up having to get subsequent follow-up tests that's more expense, more anxiety, more hassle, you actually are doing harm. So this was a um, letter from the chief medical officer of one of the companies to um, uh, this was in the Washington Post article. Instead of debating the questionable points of this article, I prefer to share a letter I received this week from a recently screened participant. And he goes on to talk about how so many grateful patients have written in saying, well, Lifeline Screening saved my life, Healthline, uh, or health fair technicians found the blockage in my so-and-so artery. And so there are all kinds of testimonials. And so this is, you know, the plural of anecdote is not data. They throw these anecdotes back at us when we criticize them. And that's, their, that's the power of their seduction and their advertising. Similarly, when we question the value and validity of their uh, screening uh, tests, usually what they throw back at us is the quality of the technology. We use the latest ultrasound tests and, you know, our, our tests cannot be called into question. So they're really not even arguing back on the point, they're really just, uh, it's really subterfuge. Instead of um, debating, uh, oh, this is, sorry, I read that. Every, every year or two, this is from the patient testimonial, I visit the health fair screening bus, uh, and what the technicians found absolutely saved my life. I already told you that. Okay, so how do they drum up more business? Well, so now they have you in their database. They, find the, they have found the mild to moderate plaque in your carotid artery, and so they send you a letter a year later saying, you need to be rescreened now to, to see if this has changed or progressed. Um, meanwhile, if the patient had never had the test in the first place, they certainly wouldn't need to be rescreened. They certainly could go on about their lives. You know, ar you, you can argue on the merits of the medicine of if, you know, certainly if they're a smoker, they need to stop smoking, or if, you know, it, 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 if there's going to be progression of their, of their carotid plaque. Um, we would encourage you to take a screening test, uh, sorry, we, we would not encourage you to take a screening test if you wouldn't benefit from it, although we really want everyone in the shopping mall, everyone in the church to come in and have one. Um, and then regular screenings can help you live a fuller, healthier life. Um, so again, the, that call to action, discourage hospitals from participating, um, certainly discourage your religious institutions from participating under the guise that they're doing good work. Um, and then there's this sort of new area. So I took this to the um, 
ethics committee at, at this local hospital that has this CT scanner because I sit on the ethics committee um, with my McLean credential. And so I raised this and I said, you know, our hospital here is promoting these, these, these low value tests and we're, we live in an era of high value cost conscious care. Is this something we as an ethics committee want to write to our or take to our hospital management? And let me tell you, there was a very dim view of my idea. Basically, the ethics committee essentially wanted to wash their hands and say, listen, we're here for ethical conflict. We're here for patient related matters. This is really a business and a professional practice issue. This is not something we want to touch. However, since you're from the university, if you want to do something from the university side of things, we would welcome that. So that was my question. And, and so one avenue in, in brainstorming about this was, you know, you, you guys going back to your own institutions, bringing this up with your hospital ethics committees, if not to shame sort of these companies into providing adequate disclaimers to at least get your hospitals not to participate in this low value activity. Um, education and media. So I mentioned I'm a proto journalist, so I'm trying to write news articles or, or spread the word that way. And then lastly, probably judicial or administrative action. How about having, uh, for example, the FTC or something come down on these folks for promulgating these basically false advertising claims. So this is interesting. So Thomas Jefferson actually s stopped after their one year deal with, um, was it Healthline or Healthfair? Because basically out of 5,000 screened patients, they only got about 20 patients to come in and get additional help. So in fact, even in a, as a business plan, it didn't, was not effective for them. So there's lots of education out there about overdiagnosis, and I didn't have time in this talk to really take you on a tour of that. But the high value curriculum is highly touted by both the American College of Physicians, the American Board of Internal Medicine. Uh, if you're in a different specialty, I would encourage you that it's, it's sort of broadly applicable. There's lots of internal medicine examples, but that principle applies to you know, whatever specialty you're in. Um, they're really pushing this at the, the residency level, the, the GME level, they want us to um, promote the high value curriculum at, uh, in our residency level at our annual program director meeting. The British Medical Journal runs a uh, section called Overdiagnosis, where it's a recurring feature. And then uh, JAMA Internal Medicine, which used to be the archives, has a recurring series called Less is More, all about the phenomenon of overdiagnosis, really with a the theme that sometimes doing less is actually the much better medicine. Um, PrivateHealthScreen.org is actually, uh, and I should tell you, these screening companies are not just in the United States, where we have free enterprise, they're actually also in the UK and Europe. And so there's a British physician, a GP named Margaret McCartney, who's, who works in Glasgow, and she has set up this whole website and as part of a network of National Health Service physicians who are decrying this overuse, overtesting, overspending, and then of course your various social media things. So one last thing to share with you, I know my time is pretty much up. Um, there's a blogger who told me to use this story, his name's Kenny Lynn, he is at Georgetown and he, uh, he's a family physician and he blogs at Common Sense Family Doctor. So he wrote a blog post about, because he went to his own church where his own church was offering this test and he was appalled, so he talked to his deacon about the low value nature of of the, uh, uh, this test, and he asked, he wanted his church not to participate in this anymore. So he wrote a blog post about the experience. It got about six times the traffic of any of his uh, previous biggest posts. Um, and so he got a personal letter from the CEO of one of the screening companies in question. Uh, and he shared this letter with me uh, and said I could use it. And so he said, I'm writing in the hopes that we can quietly and privately discuss our differences. We believe in the right screenings of the right people for the right time. I'm writing you privately to ask that this not be used as fodder. Well, too bad. <laughs> so just say no.